Hey guys, welcome to spec transfer and to topic 3.1.2, carbohydrates from the AQA A-level biology specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. First, we should know about monosaccharides, which are the monomers from which larger carbohydrate polymers are made. And yes, most carbohydrates are polymers. And we should know the most common monosaccharides. We should know about the condensation reaction between two monosaccharides and the formation of disaccharides. We should know the names of different disaccharides and the monosaccharides which they are made of. We should also know the two isomers of glucose, alpha and beta glucose, and we should know their structure. We should know about polysaccharides, in particular glycogen, starch and cellulose. We should know about their basic structure and function and the relationship of their structures to their individual functions in animal and plant cells. Finally, we should know how to test for both reducing and non-reducing sugars using Benedict solution and how to test for starch using iodine solution. So let's make a start. Most carbohydrates are polymers. They are made of the elements C, H and O. The monomers they are made from are monosaccharides. There are three types of monosaccharide that we need to know. Glucose, fructose and galactose. Note that you only need to know how to draw glucose. Glucose, fructose and galactose are isomers, which means that they have the same molecular formulae but a different arrangement of atoms in space, i.e. they contain the same number of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen atoms, but these are arranged differently in each different monosaccharide. Next we need to know about disaccharides. Disaccharides are formed by the condensation of two monosaccharides. A condensation reaction between two monosaccharides forms a glycosidic bond. To recap condensation reactions, just follow the link to my previous video on monomers and polymers top right. So we need to know different disaccharides and their constituent monosaccharides. Here we have it in a table. Maltose is a disaccharide that is formed by the condensation of two glucose monomers. Sucrose is formed by the condensation of a glucose and a fructose monomer. And lactose is formed by the condensation of a glucose and a galactose monomer. Note that each of these disaccharides contains at least one glucose monomer. So next we need to know the two isomers of glucose, alpha and beta glucose. Both alpha and beta glucose have an H and OH on either side. The difference is that in alpha glucose, the H and OH are on the same side, i.e. here we have two H's and here we have two OH's. In beta glucose, the H and OH here have been flipped over, so now we have H's and OH's on opposite sides. Note to learn this diagram as you should be able to draw it in exams. Next we need to know about polysaccharides. These are formed by the condensation of many glucose monomers, hence the name poly which means many and saccharides which means sugars, i.e. many sugars. The polysaccharides we need to know about are starch, glycogen and cellulose. So let's start off with starch. This is the main carbohydrate storage in plants. It is formed by the condensation of alpha-glucose. In starch formation, molecules of alpha-glucose can be synthesized into amylose and amylopectin, and starch is a mixture of the two. Amylose is an unbranched helical polymer of alpha-glucose. It gets its helical structure from the bond angles of the glycosidic bonds. Amylopectin, on the other hand, is a long, branched polymer of alpha-glucose. So how does the structure of starch relate to its function? First of all, starch is compact due to the helical structure of amylose, so lots of glucose can be stored in a small space. This makes it an efficient energy store. Also, amylopectin has many branches, increasing the number of points where enzymes can attach, so many glucose monomers can be released rapidly. Finally, starch is insoluble so it doesn't affect water potential, so water isn't drawn into or out of cells by osmosis. Next we have glycogen. This is the main energy storage in animals. Its structure is the same as amylopectin, just that it has more branches. So how does structure relate to function? This is similar to starch. Glycogen has many branches, increasing the number of points where enzymes can attach, so many glucose monomers can be released rapidly. It is also compact, so lots of it can be stored in a small space, making it an efficient energy store. Like starch, it is insoluble, so it doesn't affect water potential, so it doesn't cause water to be drawn into or out of cells by osmosis. Finally, we have cellulose. Cellulose is made of long, unbranched chains of beta-glucose. The bonding of beta-glucose forms a straight chain. 
These chains run in parallel to each other and are linked by hydrogen bonds to form microfibrils. Note that the large number of hydrogen bond cross-linkages makes the fiber very strong. Many microfibrils are arranged in parallel groups called fibers. These fibers are laid down in a cell wall in different directions, creating tensile strength in all directions. Finally, we need to know some biochemical tests for reducing sugars, non-reducing sugars and starch. So let's start off with a test for sugars. Sugar is a general term for monosaccharides and disaccharides. They can be classed as reducing and non-reducing. So reducing sugars include the monosaccharides glucose, fructose and galactose and the disaccharides maltose and lactose. And non-reducing sugars include sucrose. So the test that we use for reducing and non-reducing sugars is slightly different depending on the type of sugar. For reducing sugars, we add Benedict's solution and heat in a water bath that's been brought to boil for two minutes. The positive results will be a coloured brick red precipitate that forms. Here we can see how the colour should change and the higher the concentration of reducing or semi-reducing sugar, the further the colour change goes. Note that this colour change happens because the sugars donate electrons to Cu2 plus ions in the Benedict solution, reducing them to Cu plus ions, which gives us the brick red precipitate. For non-reducing sugars, first of all we would carry out the Benedict's test like before, just to confirm that it is not a reducing or a semi-reducing sugar. The Benedict solution should stay blue. Then we add dilute hydrochloric acid and heat in a water bath that's been brought to boil. Add sodium hydrogen carbonate to neutralize. Then we repeat the Benedict's test, and this time a brick red precipitate should form. Note that we need to add the acid at the start to hydrolyze the non-reducing sugar into its monosaccharides. Only then can these reduce Cu2 plus ions into Cu plus ions, giving us the brick red precipitate. The final test we need to know is the one for starch. For this we add iodine dissolved in potassium iodide solution. The positive result is that the solution changes colour from brown orange to blue black. Great, that would be the specification covered. We've covered monosaccharides and we know the names of the most common monosaccharides. We've covered the formation of a glycosidic bond and disaccharides, as well as the disaccharides maltose, sucrose and lactose, and which monosaccharides they're each made up of. We know the structures of both alpha and beta glucose and the difference between them. We also now know about polysaccharides, in particular glycogen, starch and cellulose, and how their structures relate to their individual functions in plant and animal cells. And finally, we know the biochemical tests used to test for the presence of both reducing and non-reducing sugars, as well as the test for starch. That will be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we will be covering lipids.